talking about the family as we gear up towards Father's Day. A most important day. Because there's been a, an attack on the family, but there's really been an attack on fathers really since the 1950s. Subtle attack. And many times in many of the, the TV shows, you know, the, the father is made to look like the not so smart one. There's been a subtle undermining of the, of the male authority. And now, of course, we have it. Now it's everybody with the transgender and with all the confusion. People are confused. The devil is, is the author of confusion and he's the father of lies. Is he not? And so that's his design is to put his message out that will bring confusion. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for your presence. We ask your Holy Spirit just to be with us and to encourage us today, Father. We pray, Father, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. So the devil is just putting out lies in our society, lying to our young people about their identity. And everything can be rooted and traced back to the attack on the family because the family was the first institution that was set apart, that was established by God. And what's interesting to note is that the book of Genesis is one of the most attacked books in the Bible. Now we talked about Joshua 24. Let me just read our scripture that we were gonna, we were gonna that we meditated on this week. Joshua 24, verse 14 says this. Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. Put away the gods which your father served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourself today whom you will serve. See, you're going to have to serve somebody. You cannot remain neutral. Whether the gods which your father served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So if we want to strengthen our family, we've got to make that declaration. I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to follow God's will. But the first thing that Joshua said, he says, now, therefore, fear the Lord. That's a huge statement. Fear the Lord. Have respect. Have reverence for him. Too often people get caught up in the fear of man. They want to be accepted. They want to be loved. They want to be praised by people. But I can tell you that the praise of men is just for an instant. It goes away. One day you're the flavor of the month and then next, next month or sooner or later, no matter how great you think you are, somebody's going to come along that's going to take your slot. It happens in sports. It happens in music. It happens in business. I mean, every, every area of life that you can have success in, sooner or later, there's going to be somebody that's going to come along. So we have to put our fear, our trust, and our respect in God and what God can do through us. Don't rely on your own strength, on your own accomplishments, on your own abilities. You may have some great abilities. You may have great accomplishments, but it's God working in you. Fear the Lord. Proverbs 1, verse 7. Turn to Proverbs 1, verse 7. He says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. If you want to learn anything in this life that is going to get you where you need to go, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of that knowledge. It's the start. 
Theology used to be called the queen of sciences. Everything stemmed, everything started with the knowledge of God, with the fear of the Lord. Everything started with God. And we see that Genesis, where the family was established, has been attacked. Jesus spoke into this as well. Turn to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, verse 3. Some Pharisees came to Jesus, testing him and asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? They were testing him. And he answered and he said, have you not read that he created them from the beginning, made them male and female? For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. See, a marriage is a covenant, not between a man and a woman, but a marriage is a covenant between God, a man and a woman. It's a spiritual event. It's a supernatural event. You take two people who haven't known each other and they become one. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? And he said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it has not been this way. See, we need to go back to the beginning. Genesis It's the most, I believe it's, if, if, if you can't believe Genesis, especially the first three or four chapters, then you're just not going to do very well with the rest of the Bible because it is the beginning. The first verse, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the Hebrew, it's seven words. Seven is a perfect number. What God created in the beginning was perfect He goes on to verse nine. He says, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for immorality and marries another woman, commits adultery. The disciple said to him, if the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, it is better not to marry. <laughs> See, Jesus always raised the bar and, and made people think about what they were doing. <laughs> but it's about a commitment. It's about a covenant between God, a man, and a woman. And of course, if you're divorced, there's no condemnation in this scripture. Because we all sin and God will forgive divorce just like he'll forgive murder. The blood of Jesus is powerful. But Jesus was emphasizing the seriousness of the commitment. He was raising the bar. In other words, he was dealing with the heart. Jesus always got to the heart of the matter. but the two shall become one flesh. Now go back to Genesis. Genesis chapter one, verse 27. God says, God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him male and female. He created them. Again, the answer to the gender confusion. There's two genders. And if people think there's more, then they need God. <laughs> they need God to step in and speak to their identity. Go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 23. 
after Adam woke up and he saw, he saw Eve. Imagine, I mean, Adam was the perfect man and Eve was the perfect woman. I mean, what a great surprise when he woke up and saw this just perfect, drop dead, gorgeous, absolutely beautiful woman. And God was saying, hey, this is for you. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined. Some translations read cleave, which I think is a better translation because it really means to stick like glue to his wife and they shall become one flesh. If you're married, God wants you to stick together like glue. No matter what. My wife and I, we, we sit together like glue. Now, sometimes it's not always comfortable. And sometimes it's not always fun. And sometimes we get into some arguments. But man, we're stuck together. She's not going anywhere and I, I'm not going anywhere. No matter what. Stick like glue. Cleave. A covenant between God, man, and woman. God is a God of covenant. You realize when you were saved, God, you, can't, you come under the what? Under the new covenant. See, this is why the devil comes against marriage and comes against the family. Now, remember, we talked about a family can be a, a mother and a father and children. A family can be a mother and children. A family can be father and children. A family can be grandparents and, and children. But God wants families to stick together. I believe in every marriage you go through those seasons when you're thinking, man, this, is, this sure is hard. I mean, this sure isn't like I thought marriage was going to be. I mean, when you walk down that aisle, you're thinking, man, this is going to be a breeze. I'm not going to have those same problems that other people have. Oh, no, we're not going to do that. We're always going to love each other. It's, always, it's, it's going to be great. It's going to be fantastic. And it can be great. It can be fantastic. But how many of you know we have an enemy who wants to destroy? And we see it in our culture. Families being under attack. But the design was from the beginning and it was good. God created man and woman, male and female, and he said it was good. It was good. But the marriage is important to understand because it's not just about man and woman getting married, but it's about Christ and the church. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. He's talking about the family, but he keeps throwing in references to the church, the ecclesia, the, the gathering, the assembly. That's why we gather. That's why we assemble, because that's just what church people do, because we're called the assembly. That's why during COVID, they came against the churches. Because God is... God wants us to assemble, and the devil is scared of the church. The church is the only institution on the earth that is designed to defeat the devil. That's it. It's the church. We're not perfect. If you're trying to find the perfect church, well, it's not going to be there when you show up. Or when I show up. 
but we're in a transformation process. But Ephesians 5, verse 22, he says, Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. But then he raises the bar. He says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. And we love in our wife like Christ loved the church. Well, we can only do that by the supernatural grace of God. Period. Verse 26, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So he switches again. He's going, really, he's going for the natural and then he's going to the spiritual. How many of you know in a wedding, the focus is on the bride? Nobody looked at me and, and t told me how good looking I was when I got married. Though I was. No, it's all about the bride. You stand when the bride comes in, you know. Ba, 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 da, 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 da. Everybody wants to see the dress and, oh, wow. I mean, I'm sure people thought we're looking at Katie. They weren't looking at me, which is fine. It's fine. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to get the big head and become prideful. So God was protecting me. But the family is important because through the family, we understand the church. That God is preparing a bride glorious, spotless bride. We are the bride of Christ. We are designed to carry the glory of God. See, he said that he might present to himself the church in all her glory. See, it's as we allow God to change us by the washing of the water with the word, then we become the glorious church and then people will look at the church and go, wow, look at the church. That's the end result. Having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Now, what if Katie walked down the aisle and her wedding dress was full of wrinkles? I mean, it wouldn't have happened, but there might have been a few people going, hmm, you didn't really pay attention to that. No, when she walked down the aisle, her dress was perfect. She looked beautiful. I look at, really, to be honest with you, I look at wedding pictures, I'm thinking, why'd she marry me? I don't even know what she even saw in me. It was just God blinded her eyes. Oh, yes, you must marry Clayton. You must marry Clayton. You must marry Clayton. <laughs> See, God wants to take your life and take all of the things that are broken and need to be fixed and all of your shortcomings, and he wants to bring his glory upon you and make you into something beautiful. Make your life into something Beautiful that people can look at and say, wow, I want that. I want what you have. I want the peace and the joy. I want the blessing of God that I, that I see on your life. There's just something different. See, that's why we're in covenant. We're engaged in a sense. Well, we are engaged to Jesus. I mean, we're his, we're his bride. And of course, the marriage supper of the Lamb will be when the, the big event. But right now we're in a process where God wants to put his glory upon us in such to such a degree upon the church that people will be drawn to the church.
And he goes on, now he switches back to the natural. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. He's saying that's how, that's how close. When you get married, you, your wife is part of you. So you love your wife like you would love yourself. You take care of your wife like you would take care of yourself. He who loves his own wife loves himself for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it. So husbands, your job is to nourish and to cherish your wife to encourage her in her giftings and callings, to encourage her in raising children. Yes, we should have children. I was one who did not want to have children, was scared to death of it. But it was, it's awesome. It makes life worth, worthwhile. When you see your kids and they grow up and it's a huge blessing. It's a huge blessing. But no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ does a church. Now, isn't that interesting? Jesus is nourishing you and he's cherishing you. He's looking at you with love. He's looking at you with compassion, like, wow. See, God, God wants to help us. He doesn't want to hurt us. He wants to help us. He said, because we are members of his body. We are his body. So Christ loves us so much. And then he switches to the natural again for this reason. Again, and he quotes this first. It's Jesus quoted it. Paul quoted it. It's in Genesis. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and his church. He switches back to the spiritual. The devil attacks everything God establishes. So we shouldn't be surprised when we see the war against the family because it's really the war against the church. But it's a war that we're going to win, folks. And I'm here to tell you right now, the devil's not going to win. And the devil's not going to win in America because I see the church rising up. I see true churches rising up all over this country and taking a stand. And I'm telling you, the devil may think that he's getting his way and having an upper hand, but I'm telling you right now, God is coming. Well, he's already here, but he's coming with more glory because he wants the church to have the glory of God, the church in all of her glory. Whose glory? The glory of God. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. Again, we have this phrase, so important, but Paul, again, he's talking about the natural, but then he switches to the spiritual. Now, Corinth was a very ungodly city. They were known for its prostitution. So he says, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, the two shall become one flesh. So he's leading by way of example. Of course, he's telling people, don't be immoral. Don't have sex outside of marriage. Stay pure. But verse 17, he switches to the spiritual. He said, but the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. 
If you are saved, then you are one spirit. Your spirit, man, is joined with God just like a man and woman are joined together in marriage. Go to chapter 12, verse 13. Chapter 12, verse 13, still in 1 Corinthians. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. I mean, it, you realize the, the significance of that. I mean, if you were saved, you are connected to God. You are connected to God Almighty. The same God that was here at the beginning of the world at creation. I don't know how it happened. I don't know how God created everything. I know he spoke everything into existence, but you know what? You can't study the creation because we weren't there. Science is about observation and you, you, you can't study it. I mean, we, there's definitely a lot of Christian scientists that confirm a lot of the things in the Bible, but the bottom line is, is that we weren't there. But what happened was supernatural. And we are joined together with a supernatural God. We are one with God. And that has benefits. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18 says this, for through him, talking about Jesus, because Jesus is the connector that connects us to God, for through him, we have access in one spirit to the Father. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Yes, if you want to get to God, you absolutely have to believe that Jesus Christ was God, that he was the Son of God, and there's no other way to get to the Father. You have to go through Jesus. You cannot just say, I believe in God. You have to go through Jesus, period. That's all there's to it. I've had people say, well, you tell me that if I don't believe in Jesus, I... Uh, and I believe, just believe in God, that I'm not going to get to God. No, you're not. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. <laughs> For through him, we have both our access in one spirit to the Father. He said, so you are no longer strangers and aliens, but are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. While wow, we are in God's house. See, Brandon was talking about Blessing. I mean, we're, we're in God's house. We're in a blessed house. I mean, Abraham was blessed. God wants to bless the church. God wants to bless you. The question is, do you really believe that God wants to bless me? You. Me. You. Me and you. Sometimes that's the hardest thing to believe. You can believe it for other people. But we're of God's Household. See, God wants to raise up his people in this hour. I believe in society, he wants to raise up Christian businessmen, Christian musicians and doctors and lawyers, people of faith. He wants to raise up so that we can have influence and we can show the glory of God. And God has done that amazingly back in the 70s. Well, when my parents were saved during the charismatic renewal, of course, I was always into music. And that's in the early days of the Christian music. I guess you could say Christian contemporary music, whatever. My father owned a, a business at that time. And on uh, once a week, we, we would go. They had this Christian bookstore and I would get one Christian album a week. I would, I, would, I would work with my dad and we would go and we'd get one album a week in the early days, right? That's when nobody really knew there was Christian music. I mean, of course, you had gospel music, but there wasn't a, there wasn't a market like there is today. But now we have a whole market. Now, it's not perfect. Yeah, there's some stuff goes on. There's some stuff in Christian music that shouldn't go on, but there's also a lot of good too. 
See, God's, God has done that. You realize that America is the only country that has a Christian music market? Matt Redman, who's a worship leader from England, one thing that he said several years ago was that how blessed we were that we actually had a Christian, you know, Christian music section. You know, like in England, they don't have that. If you're a Christian and you put out an album, they just kind of throw it out there with everybody and it's hard to find. Nobody knows who you are. But in America, even on Apple Music, right, there's a section Christian. There's a section gospel. I mean, you realize how blessed we are? We don't realize how blessed we are in this nation. Nobody looks like y'all believe me. I mean, this nation was a miracle. The people that founded this nation that, per that first came made a covenant with God. We learned it all in our biblical citizenship class. So much is not taught anymore that needs to be taught. So I don't know about you, but I'm not going to just sit back and let the devil take over America. But I want us to be salt and light. Amen. I want us to have influence. That's why I want my children to be blessed. I speak the favor of God over my children because I want them to be blessed. I want them to have influence in whatever field God has chosen, whether it's in business, whether they go in ministry, whatever they go into. I want them to have the favor of God to have influence, to be salt and light. We are connected with God. That's why the family is so important because when we understand the family, we understand the relationship of Christ and the church and how connected that we are to God. See, Jesus, he wants to, he, he, he cherishes you. He loves you so much. He loves his church. That's why you better be careful when you talk about churches because it's his bride. Every church has their issues. I can't stand those guys on YouTube that all they do is criticize, criticize. You know what? You, you let God take care of it. Judgment begins in the house of God. If something's wrong, God's going to take care of it. You don't have to. People don't have to get on YouTube and point out every little thing in somebody's sermon. Well, they said this and this was wrong and that was wrong. You're just wasting your time. I, I, I don't want a ministry like that. It's based on criticizing other people. I, I want a ministry that's based on glorifying Jesus and bringing people to Christ. Now, we don't ignore sin and, and we don't condone sin at all. That's not what I'm saying. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. There is one body and one spirit. You're either in the church or you're not in the church. Just also as you're called into one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. See, God is a God of unity, not a God of division. The devil causes confusion and division. What did Jesus say? He said, I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. I only do what I see the Father doing. That was an example for us. That we should do the word. Now let's look at, let's go back to Ephesians as we close. Go back to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. So that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. God wants to cleanse us. He wants to wash us. It's the word that cleanses us. That's why, man, I'm so excited about our, our study because we're, we're going to get washed by the word. We're going to get cleansed. We're, we're going to get transformed. God's going to strengthen us and encourage us. 
so that we can be men of God and we can lead our families, we can lead our children, we can lead our businesses and whatever God has called us to do, we can lead in sincerity and in truth like Joshua 24. So don't let anything, first of all, if you're married, don't let anything come between you and your wife. And if you're a Christian, don't let anything come between you and God. Don't let what people do. Don't let your own attitudes, your own disappointments, your anger, don't let anything come between that, that oneness that we have with God, that we, are, that we are connected to God. Just like a husband and wife are joined together. Don't let anything come between that. Now, next week, we're going to talk about revival. And we're going to talk about what I believe is one of the keys to revival. And it stems from family. It stems from what God wants to do with the church, with the washing of the water and the word of God. But God is a God of covenant. So stay in covenant with God. Don't let anything come between you and God. Just like a husband protects his wife, don't let anything come between me and and my wife. Those are fighting words. When the devil tries to come and separate you from the church, separate you from believers, those should be fighting words. And you need to get up the sword and say no. I'm not going to let the devil come between me and the church. I'm not going to let the devil come between me and God because the devil wants to divide and conquer. We see that. That's what's going on in our nation. This group, that group, you're this, you're that. No, we are all one. We all came from Adam. There's only one human race, folks. It's called the human race. And I think I just said that. The idea of different races. Now, of course, there's always been different cultures. Every family has its own culture, but there's only one race. So we're all, we all come from Adam. There may be cultural differences, but we all come from God. And God wants us to be in unity with him and with his church. Amen? Amen. So, Father, we thank you for your presence today, Father. And, Lord, we thank you, Father. Even as Jesus said, Father, make, make us one. Make, make, make them one, even as you and I are one. That, that's, that's what Jesus said. Now, being one, being in unity doesn't mean that we all have to agree with everything. We all have different Opinions about certain things, but on certain issues, of course, there's no compromise. So Jesus, I pray right now.